one confidential evening, not three months ago, Lionel Wallace told me the story of the door in the wall. And I thought that at the time, so far as he was concerned, it was a true story. You know, he, he told it with such a direct simplicity of conviction. But in the morning, in my own flat, I woke to a rather different atmosphere. And as I lay in bed and recalled the things that he told me, stripped of the glamour of his earnest, slow voice and the shadowy atmosphere that wrapped about him, I saw it all as frankly incredible. He was mystifying, I said to myself. But how well he did it. And it isn't quite the thing I should have expected him, of all people, to, to do well at all. Afterwards, as I sat up in bed and sipped my morning tea, I found myself trying to account for the flavour of reality that had perplexed me in his impossible reminiscences by supposing that they did in some way suggest or present or convey, I mean, I hardly know which word to use, but somehow that they, they brought across experiences which was otherwise impossible to tell. Well, I, I don't resort to that explanation now. I, I've got over my intervening doubts. I believe now, as I believed at the moment of telling, that Lionel Wallace did, to the very best of his ability, strip the truth of his secret to me. But whether he, he really saw or only thought he saw, you know, whether he was the possessor of an inestimable privilege or the victim of a fantastic dream, that I cannot pretend to guess. That much you must judge for yourselves. Now, I, I forget now what chance comment of mine moved so reticent a man to confide in me in the first place. He was, I think, defending himself against an imputation of slackness that I made in relation to a great public movement in which he disappointed me. But he plunged suddenly. I have a preoccupation, he said. I, I know I, I, I've been negligent and I'm sorry, but... Well, the fact is, old man, and it's not a case of ghosts or apparitions. And it's an odd thing to tell you about, but... Well, I'm haunted... I'm haunted by something that rather takes the light out of things, that fills me with longings. He paused, checked by that shyness that so often overcomes Englishmen when we would speak of moving or grave or beautiful things. And then, haltingly at first, but afterwards much more easily, he began to tell of the thing that was hidden in his life, the haunting memory that made all the interest and spectacle of worldly existence seem dull and tedious and vain. And you see now that I have the clue of it, of course, the thing seems written visibly in his face. I, I've got a photograph in which just that look of detachment has been caught and intensified. It reminds me of what a woman once said of him, a woman who loved him very much. Suddenly, she said, the interest goes out of him. He forgets you. He doesn't care a rap for you under his very nose. And yet, you see, the interest did not always go out of Lionel Wallace. And when he was holding his attention to a thing, he could contrive to be an extremely successful man. The door in the wall came into his life early when he was a little boy, between five and six years old. I recall, as he sat making his confession to me, how he reasoned and reckoned the date of it. Yeah, there was a the cr crimson Virginia creeper in it, he said, and, and, and there were horse chestnut leaves on the pavement in, in front of the door. I remember that very clearly, that, and they were blotched green and yellow, you know, no, they weren't brown or dirty, so they must have been newly fallen. So I take it that, that means October. So, yeah, I, I'd have been about five years and four months old. He was, he said, a rather precocious little fellow. His mother had died when he was born, and his earliest years were spent under the care of a nursery governess. His father was a, a stern, preoccupied man, a prominent lawyer, who gave him little attention and expected great things of him. But, you see, for all his brightness, young Lionel found life grey and dull. And one day... He wandered, 
Now, he, he couldn't recall the particular neglect that enabled him to get away that day, nor the precise course that he took among the West Kensington streets. All that had faded among the, the incurable blurs of memory. But the white wall and the green door stood out quite distinctly. At the very first sight of that door, he said, he experienced an intense emotion, a, a strong desire to go up to it, open it and walk in. He insisted that somehow he knew from the very beginning that the door was unfastened. But at the same time, you see, he had, had the, the clearest conviction that it was either unwise or wrong of him to yield to this attraction. And it was very clear in his mind, too, that if he went through that door, then his father would be very angry. I, I, I can picture it to myself clearly, the, the, the curious little boy, drawn and repelled at the same time. And, and Wallace himself described it to me with the, the utmost particularity. He went right past the door, he said, and then with his hands in his pockets and making an infantile attempt to whistle, he strolled right along beyond the end of the wall. And there he recalls a number of dirty little shops, particularly that of a plumber and a decorator with a, a dusty pile of earthenware pipes and tins of enamel paint. He was pretending to examine these when suddenly, with a gust of emotion, he made a run for it, went plump with outstretched hands through the green door and let it slam behind him, and in a trice he came into the garden that haunted his life. Now, it was very difficult of Wallace to give me his full sense of the place, that there was something in the very air of it that exhilarated, he said, that, that gave one a, a sense of lightness and good happening and well-being. In the very moment that the, the door swung behind me, I forgot the road with its fallen chestnut leaves and cabs and tradesmen's carts. You know, I forgot all the hesitations and fear and discretion, all the intimate realities of life. And I became in a moment a very glad and wonder-happy little boy. He mused before he went on. There were two great panthers there, he said. <laughs> yeah, spotted panthers. And I wasn't at all afraid, you see. There, there was a, a long, wide path with flower borders on either side, and then these two huge, velvety beasts were, were playing on it with a ball. One of them came straight up to me, purring, and rubbed his ear against my hand. God, the size of the place. Oh, I, I, it stretched so far and wide, this way and that. I think there were, there were hills in the distance. Heaven knows where West Kensington had got to. And, and there was a keen sense of homecoming in my mind too, you see. So when presently a tall, beautiful girl appeared in the pathway and lifted me up and kissed me and put me down and led me by the hand, there was no amazement. You know, there was only an impression of delightful rightness, of being reminded of happy things that it had in some strange way been overlooked. There, there were broad steps between spikes of delphinium, I remember, and we went up these to a great avenue lined with old dark trees. And along this avenue, the beautiful girl led me, asking me questions in a a soft, sweet voice and telling me things, very pleasant things, although what they were, I, I was never able to recall. Presently, a grinning little monkey with, with ruddy brown fur and kindly hazel eyes came down a tree and ran beside me, chattering, and then it leapt up on my shoulder. And the three of us just went on our way in the greatest of happiness. I, I remember little things. We... we we passed an old man musing among laurels and a, a place gay with parakeets. And, and then we came to a, a broad colonnade, to, to a kind of palace full of beautiful things and people. And in some way, and again, I, I, I don't know how, but it was conveyed to me very powerfully that they were all glad that I was there. Playmates I found there, and that meant a lot because I was a lonely little boy. But, but it's odd, you see, I just can't remember the games that we played. I mean, afterwards, as a child, I spent long hours trying to recall them. These games, but all I remembered is the happiness. And two dear playfellows in particular who were the most with me. 
eventually a a woman arrived with, with a a grave, pale face and dreamy eyes. She carried a book with her and she beckoned me and took me aside into a gallery above the hall where we were playing. Now, my, my playmates were loath to have me go and they, they stood watching sadly as I was carried away. Come back to us, they cried. <laughs> Come back to us soon. I, I looked up at the, the lady's grave, gentle face, but she heeded them not at all. She took me to a, a seat in the gallery and I stood beside her ready to look at the book as she opened it on her knees. Well, the pages fell open and I looked at it marvelling because in the living pages of that book, I saw myself. It was a story about me and in it were all the things that had happened since I was born. And the pages on that book, they weren't pictures. They were realities. They must have been. They, they were realities. You know, people moved and things came and went in them. My mother, now my father, the servants, the nursery, all the familiar things of home and then the front door and the busy streets, and at last there was me, hovering and hesitating outside the green door in the long white wall. And what's next, I said. What, what, what's next? I tried to turn the page, but the cool hand of the woman delayed me. What's next? I insisted, and I struggled with the hand, pulling up her fingers with all my childish strength. And at last she yielded. And the page came over, and as, as it did, she bent down upon me like a shadow and kissed my brow. But you see, the page that it turned to did not show the enchanted garden. It didn't show the panthers or the girl who led me by the hand or the playfellows who had been so loath to let me go. What it showed was a long, grey street in West Kensington in that chill hour of the afternoon before the lamps are lit, and a little boy weeping uncontrollably. And this was no longer a page in a book. This was reality. You know, that enchanted place, that grave mother at whose knees I stood, gone. He fell silent and stared at the fire. Well? I said after a minute, well, there I was, you know, poor little Lionel, brought back to this grey world again. And as I realised the, the fullness of what had happened, I gave way to quite ungovernable grief. God, the shame of that public weeping, it, it clings to me still, and my humiliating homecoming. You know, I, I can still see the benevolent old gentleman in gold spectacles who, who stopped and spoke to me. And, and then the, the nervous young policeman who marched me, sobbing and frightened, to the steps of my father's house and the terrible questioning that followed, of course. You know, I tried to tell them about the garden and my father thrashed me for telling lies. And then when I tried to tell my aunt, she punished me again for my wicked persistence. And then everyone was forbidden to listen to me at all, to hear a word about it. You know, even my fairy tale books were taken away from me because I was too imaginative. You know, they actually said that. God, can you believe it? And so my story was driven back upon myself. You know, I, I, I whispered it into my pillow and I always added to my official and less fervent prayers this one heartfelt request. Please, God, may I dream of the garden. Oh, take me back to my garden. Take me back to my garden, Heavenly Father. And I did. I, I dreamed of it often. I mean, I, I, I added to it probably changed it, of course. I don't know. All, all this you must understand is an attempt to, to reconstruct from fragmentary memories a very early experience. Between that and the, the other consecutive memories of my boyhood, there is a, a very great gulf. He paused again, and I asked an obvious question. No, he said. No, I, I, I don't remember that I 
I ever did attempt to find my way back to the garden in those early years. I, I, it, it does. It seems odd. I agree. But I, I think, oh, very probably a, a closer watch was kept on me after that first time. And in fact, it wasn't until school that I tried for the garden again. Do you, do you remember me at St. Athelstan's? Of course I do, I said. How can you possibly ask that? Yeah, I, I know, I know. But you, you, you never played Northwest Passage with me, did you? No, of course, you, you lived in the other direction. Well, it was a good game, Northwest Passage. The idea was to discover a, a new way to school. So you, you, you started off 10 minutes early in some almost hopeless direction, and you had to work your way around through unaccustomed streets right to the school gate. Well, one day I got entangled among some rather low-class streets on the other side of Campton Hill, and I was beginning to think that for once the, the game would be against me and I'd be late for school. I rather desperately tried this street that looked like a cul-de-sac, but sure enough, I found a passage at the end of it. And as I hurried through with renewed hope, I passed a row of frowsy little shops that were oddly familiar to me, and suddenly there it was. The long white wall and my green door. Now, I suppose that this second encounter marks the difference between the busy life of the schoolboy and the infinite leisure of the child. Anyhow, this second time, I didn't for a moment thinking of going straight in. My, my mind was full of the idea of getting to school on time for, for not breaking my record for punctuality. And oh, I was, all right, I, I, I suppose I, I must have felt some little desire to at least try the door. I, I must have. And I was immediately interested by the discovery, of course. I, I went on with my mind full of it. But well, I went on, you see. No, it didn't check me. And I got to school, breathless and wet with perspiration, but I was on time. I expect I was pretty inattentive in class that morning, recalling what I could of the beautiful, strange people that I should presently see again. I, I, I had no doubt that they'd be glad to see me. I, I, you know, I, I must have thought of that garden all that morning as, as a jolly sort of place to which one might resort in the interlude of a, a strenuous scholastic career. Well, I didn't go that day at all. Next day was a, a half holiday, and that, that may have weighed with me, I don't know. What I do know is that the enchanted garden was so much on my mind that I, I couldn't keep it to myself. Oh, I told, oh God, now what was his name now? Therity looking little chap, remember? I think we, we used to call him Squiffer, Hopkins, I said. That's, that's it, it was, it, it was Hopkins, it was Squiffer Hopkins. Well, I mean, I didn't like telling him, of course. I had a feeling that in some way it was against the rules to tell Squiffer Hopkins, but well, you know, he, he was walking part of the way home with me, and if we hadn't talked about the Enchanted Garden, we'd have talked about something else, and I, well, I just couldn't think of anything else, you see, so I blabbed. And then Hopkins blabbed as well, of course. Next day at break time, I found myself surrounded by half a dozen bigger boys, half teasing and wholly curious to hear more about this enchanted garden. It was Fawcett, remember him? Big brute Fawcett and Carnaby and Morley Reynolds. I, 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 I rather suspect there's on some level, I was maybe a little flattered to have the attention of these big fellows. In fact, I remember a moment of pleasure when Crawshaw, you, you remember Crawshaw, son of the conductor? Yeah, well, he said that it was the best lie that he'd ever heard. But at the same time, there was a, an undertow of shame at telling what I felt was, in fact, a sacred secret. Fawcett made a, a nasty joke about the beautiful girl I, I pretended not to hear. And then Carnaby suddenly got aggressive. He called me a dirty liar. And he, he got even angrier when I kept insisting that it was true. I said that I could lead them all to the green door in 10 minutes if they didn't believe me. And Carnaby said that I damned well have to. Well, did you ever have Carnaby twist your arm? No, well, lucky you is all I can say. There was nobody in the school then who would stand up to Carnaby, although Crawshaw did put in a good word for me, I'm glad to say. Anyhow, the outcome was that instead of starting alone for my enchanted garden, I set off, cheeks flushed, eyes smarting, and my soul burning with misery and shame, leading a part of six mocking schoolboys. 
though we never found it, of course. What, you mean? I mean, I couldn't find it. Wall, door, garden, none of it. And afterwards, when, when I went alone, I couldn't find it either. I never found it. It seems now that I was always looking for it all through my school days, but I never came across it again. But did the fellows make it disagreeable? God, well, you can imagine, can't you? Absolutely beastly. I remember how I sneaked home and upstairs to mark the sign of my blubbering. But when I cried myself to sleep at last, it wasn't for what Carnaby had done. It was for the garden. You know, it was for the, the, the beautiful afternoon that I'd hoped for, for the, the sweet, friendly women, the waiting playfellows and the game. That game that I was desperate to learn again, that beautiful forgotten game. And I, 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 I had bad times after that, crying at night and wool gathering by day. For two terms, I, I slackened and had bad reports. Do you remember? <laughs> no, of course you remember. It was, it was you beating me at maths that brought me back to the grind again. I never saw the door again until I was 17. I was driving to Paddington on my way to Oxford for the, the scholarship exam. And I, I just caught a momentary glimpse. I, I was leaning over the apron of the cab, smoking a cigarette, and no doubt thinking to myself, no end of a man of the world. And suddenly there was the door, the wall, the dear sense of unforgettable, unattainable wonders. I mean, I, I was too taken by surprise to, to stop the cab until we were well past and round a corner. And then I had this queer moment. It was a, a, a double and divergent movement of the wheel. I tapped the little door in the roof of the cab and I immediately brought down my arm to pull out my watch. Yes, sir, said the cabman. Oh, no, nothing. So ignore me, my mistake. Sorry, we, we haven't much time. Please go on. And he did, of course, he went on. And I got my, my scholarship. And the night that I found out, I sat over my fire in my room, my father's rare praise and sound counsels ringing in my ears. And I, I smoked my favourite pipe and I thought of that door in the long white wall. I mean, if I'd stopped, I said to myself, I'd have missed my scholarship. You know, I'd have missed Oxford. I'd have muddled all the fine career before me. I fell musing deeply. But, I, you know, I didn't doubt then that this career of mine was a thing that merited sacrifice, you know? Those dear playmates, that clear atmosphere seemed very sweet to me, very fine, but it was remote, you know. My grip was fixing now upon the world. I saw another door opening, the door of my career. He stared into the fire, and it, its red light picked out a, a stubborn strength in his face with just one flickering moment, and, and then it vanished again. Well, I, I've served that career, as you know. I've done much work, yeah? much hard, hard work. But you see, I have dreamt of that enchanted garden a thousand times since then. And I've seen its door four times. Yeah, four times. I mean, for a while, though, the world seemed so bright and interesting and full of meaning and opportunity that the half-effaced charm of a garden seemed absurd and remote. I mean, who wants to play ball with panthers when you can dance with beautiful women? I came down from Oxford, a man of bold promise that I think I've done something to redeem my life. There have been disappointments, of course there have, yeah. Twice I've been in love, and I'm not going to dwell on that. But you see, once, as I went to someone who I know doubted whether I dared to come, I took a shortcut through an unfrequented road near Earl's Court, and I happened upon a white wall and a familiar green door. Now that's odd, I said to myself. I thought this place was in Campton Hill. It's the place that I could never find somehow, the the place of that queer daydream of mine. You know, I, I had just a moment's impulse to try the door. You know, three steps aside was all that was needed. And, and I was sure in my heart, well, I knew that it would open to me. 
And then I thought that doing that might delay me on the way to that appointment in which I thought that my honour was involved. Well, afterwards, I was sorry for my punctuality. You know, I might at least have peeped in, I thought, waved a hand to the Panthers. But no, I, mean, I knew enough by that time to not seek again belatedly that which is not found by seeking. And Well, yeah, that occasion did make me very sad. Years of hard work after that, of course, never a sight of the door. It's only recently that it started coming back to me. And you see, with it, there's kind of sense as though some thin tarnish has spread itself over the world. I, all right, perhaps it's overwork. Perhaps it's what I've heard spoken of as the feeling of 40. I don't know. But what I do know is that the keen brightness that makes effort easy has gone out of things recently. And that just at a time when, with all these new political developments, when I ought to be working harder than ever. You know, I, I began a little while ago to want the garden quite madly. And I've seen it three times since. What, the garden, I said? Oh, no, 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 not that, sorry, just the door. No, 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 not the garden. No, just the door. Three times I've had my chance, old man. Three times. And, you know, if ever that door offers it to myself to me again, I said, I will go in, you know, out of this dust and heat, out of this dry glitter and vanity, out of these toilsome futilities. I'll go and I'll never return. That, the next time I'll stay. You know, I swore that to myself. And when the time came, I didn't go. Three times in one year. I've passed that door and I've failed to enter it. Three times. First time it was on the the night of the snatch division on the tenants redemption bill on which the government was saved by a majority of three. I mean, I'm sure you haven't forgotten that. I mean, no one on our side, perhaps very few in the opposition, expected the end that night. And then the, the debate collapsed like eggshells. Hotchkiss and I were, were dining with his cousin at Brentford and we were suddenly called up by the telephone and we set off at once in his cousin's motor. And we, we, we got there barely in time. On the way, we passed my wall and the door. It, it was livid in the moonlight, blotched, hot, yellow as the glare of our lamps lit it, but it was absolutely unmistakably the same one. My God, I cried. What? said Hotchkiss. Oh, nothing, nothing, I said. And the moment passed. I've made a great sacrifice, I said to the whip as I got into the house. They all have, he said, and hurried by. But I suppose I, I, I don't see how I could have done any differently then. And the next occasion was when I, I rushed to my father's bedside to bid that stern old man farewell. And then, too, I suppose you've got to say that the claims of life are imperative. But the third time was different. It was only a week ago. And it, it fills me with the hottest remorse to think of it. I was with Gurkha and Ralphs. It's no secret, you know, that I've had my talk with the Gurkha. You know, we, we, we've been dining at Frobisher's and the talk had become intimate between us. The, the question of my place in the, the reconstructed ministry lay always just over the, the boundary of the discussion. I, it's all settled now, by the way. I mean, probably best not to talk out of it, but the, there's no reason to keep a secret from you. The, uh, thank you. Thank you. But please, sorry, I, it's not what I'm talking about now. But let, let me get on with the story. On that particular night, you see, Things were, were very much still up in the air. My position was a very delicate one. I was anxious to get some definite word from Gurkha, but I was hampered by Ralph's presence. Now, I was doing my damnedest to keep the light and careless talk, not to obviously direct it to the point that concerned me. I mean, I had to. Ralph's behaviour has more than justified my caution. But now, you see, I knew that Ralph's would leave us just beyond Kensington High Street, and it was then that I planned to surprise Gurkha by a sudden frankness. And it was then also that in the margin of my field of vision, I became aware once more of the white wall and the green door. Before us, it was a little down the road ahead of us. 
And we walk past it, talking. I can see the shadow of Gurkha's profile, his, his opera hat tilted over his nose, going before my shadow as we sauntered past. You know, I passed within 20 inches of the door. I mean, if I say goodnight to them now and go in, I said to myself, well, what'll happen? Well, they'll think me mad. And I suppose if I were to vanish suddenly now, you know, a, a thousand inconceivably petty worldlinesses weighed in me at that moment of crisis. And here I am. Here I am. Three times in a year it's appeared. The door that goes into peace, into delight, into a beauty beyond dreaming, a kindness no man on earth can know. And three times I have rejected it. It's gone. Well, how do you know it's gone? I asked. Oh, God, I know. I know. I'm yeah. I'm left now to work it out alone, to stick to the tasks that have held me so strongly when the moments came. Well, yeah, I know. Yes, thank you. I have. I've, I've had success. I've had, I've had that vulgar, tawdry, irksome, much envied thing in excess, an excess of success, in, in abundance. But let me tell you something, my friend. This loss, it is destroying me. For two months, 10 weeks nearly now, I've done nothing. You know, I've done no work except the most necessary and urgent duties. At nights, when it's less likely that I'll be recognised, I go out into the streets, I wander around. I do. God, I, mean, I wonder what people would think if they knew that a cabinet minister, the head of that most vital of departments, wandering alone, Grieving, I mean, sometimes audibly lamenting for a door that he can never find, a garden that he'll never see again. And I, I, I can see his pallid face in front of me now. Then the unfamiliar, somber fire that had come into his eyes. Yeah, I, I do. I, I recollect him very vividly tonight. They found his body early yesterday morning in a deep excavation near East Kensington Station, one of two shafts that have been dug for the extension of the Underground Railway. It's protected from the intrusion of the public by a hoarding in which a small doorway has been cut for the convenience of the workmen who live in that direction. The doorway was left unfastened through a misunderstanding between two gangers and through it, Lionel Ward made his way. It seems that he'd walked all the way from Westminster that night. He'd frequently walked home during the past session, apparently. I, I, I can picture his dark form coming along the late and empty streets, you know, wrapped up, intent with his thoughts. Now, did perhaps the pale electric lights near the station cheat the rough planking into a semblance of white? Did that fatal, unfastened door awaken some memory within him? Was there ever any green door in the wall at all? I don't know. There are times when I believe that Wallace was no more than the victim of the coincidence between a rare but not unprecedented type of hallucination and a careless trap. But that is not my profoundest belief. I mean, you, you, you may think me superstitious, if you will, and, and foolish, but I am more than half convinced that he had, in truth, an abnormal gift and a sense, something, I, I, I don't know what, that in the guise of wall and door offered him an, out, an outlet, you know, a secret and peculiar passage of escape into a, another and altogether more beautiful world. Well, it betrayed him in the end, you say, but did it? I mean, did it betray him? There, you see, I think you, you touch upon the, the inmost mystery of these dreamers, 
these men of vision and imagination. I mean, we see our world fair and common, the hoarding and the pit. By our daylight standards, he walked out of security into darkness, danger and death. But did he see like that? 